We are Anjali and Cisha, co-curators of the Jackson Project. Um, essentially, uh, Jackson Project is a historic preservation initiative uh, rooted in the origin story of Jackson Ward. Uh, Cisha and I embarked on this project by absolute accident. Uh, we did not at all intend to do this. Uh, it actually was birthed out of uh, a film festival that I produce here in Richmond called Africana. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but this is not our first time working together. We actually uh, launched something called Black Ass Field Trips in 2018. Uh, and that is essentially where we take groups of people to spaces uh, globally uh, that are connected to not only Black history, but that have some level of tie-in to Richmond history as well. Uh, we kick things off with uh, the EJI Center in Montgomery. Uh, we also followed that up with a trip to uh, New Orleans and we're scheduled in 2020 to take a group of people to Barbados, uh, but we all know what 2020 did to everybody's plans. Uh, as far as myself, I am the founder of Africana Independent Film Festival. I'm also the assistant curator of film and special programs at the Institute for Contemporary Art at VCU. Uh, I am the founding chair of BLK RBA. Uh, I have, I'm a partner in uh, Diné en Blanc. I'm a mom. I do a few things. Uh, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, yes, so my name is Cisha Joy Moon, uh, born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. Um, like Jolene, I am, a, a, well, I guess I'm an alum of VCU. I went there for my undergrad and my master's, um, earned my PhD at Old Dominion University. Um, I currently live in the Northern Virginia area where I am the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the National Institute of Standards and Technology within the US Department of Commerce. Um, I feel like I'm a forever student. Um, I'm actually currently in a, a certification program right now with Cornell University. Um, in addition to working with my sister on a black ass field trip and the Jackson Project, I'm also a curator of an Insta blog known as Angry Black Female. And so I think that's about me in a nutshell. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, Jackson Project is a historic preservation uh, initiative that is rooted in the origin story of Jackson Ward. Uh, we are interested in learning more about uh, the importance of Richmond uh, and the importance of Jackson Ward in the Black American narrative. We, we know the importance of this space. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it is said that one in four Black people can trace their roots back to this region. Uh, and with that, what are the undertold narratives um, that exist in that? And so the Jackson Project is allowing us an opportunity to do a deeper dive into telling some of those stories. Um, as I said as well, we didn't necessarily step into this on purpose. Uh, as a part of uh, Africana, we turned five last year. Um, and like everything else, we had to pivot to virtual. Uh, but for our anniversary, we still wanted to show up in community. And so uh, wanted to do these projections in different neighborhoods, ask Cisha, the researcher, if she could just find 10 black facts. Um, about each neighborhood, one of those being Jackson Ward. Uh, that led into an investigation of the naming convention uh, of Jackson Ward, and it opened, uh, for lack of a better word, a Pandora's box uh, and led us down a pathway to learning so much more about this area in Richmond that we felt like we knew about. I spent you know, the formative years of my adult life uh, working in Jackson Ward. And so to learn uh, that there was so much more to the rich history of the space was exciting. Uh, and so we came across some information that let us know that we were embarking on the 150 year anniversary of Jackson Ward on April 17th of this year. We were able to celebrate that. Uh, and we are excited for some of the additional initiatives to come to include a street unveiling in October and some additional things. So, so yeah, you know, as Anjali said, you know, she really just sought out to project a, a across the city of Richmond and just wanted a couple of black ass facts to complement that and it led us to not only understanding an inquiry that's rooted in who is Jackson, but really it led to a social inquiry about Jackson as a 
I guess you could say a vehicle or a vessel to really um, address the origin stories of what it means to be not only Black and from Richmond, but really the Black American experience as a whole. And so these are just some of the questions that we have used to really guide guide the, the research. Um, and it's been I guess you could say quite, I, I, you know, me and Anjali say it's not accidental, it's ancestral, that we landed on this project or this project landed with us um, on the heels of 2020. And so these are just some of the questions that guide that, you know, are we going to allow the legacy of Richmond in particular to be tethered to this lost cause? Or are we really going to take this as an opportunity to kind of pivot and really center a more just one? Um, and are we really ready to, you know, tell these more multidimensional um, stories of what it meant to be Black and from Richmond, which our research will dive a little bit into. And then the biggest thing is, you know, Richmond is a local story, but this really is a national narrative. And are we really bold enough to um, advance um, the efforts of projects such as Jackson to become a North Star um, for other generations to come? And so we'll kind of get into the research at a high level. Um, really, as I, you know, as Anjali stated, this set out to question who is Jackson in Jackson Ward. And what we found is that the stains of those monuments really bleed throughout almost every intersection of this city. Um, when we really look at its schools and statues and streets, you can see many monuments all across the city of Richmond. Um, but what was, um, I guess you can say ordained about this is that it helped us understand the date in which Jackson Ward, the nation's first historically registered black urban neighborhood in this country was established, which was April 17th, 1871. And so these are just, Lee, do you wanna talk about these? This is just the gallery of some of the programs that we've done. If you just wanna talk about them real quick before I get into the research. For sure. So um, as you see here on the left, it says Illuminating Legacies, uh, Giles v. Jackson. And so one of the things that, you know, we came across, as Cecilia mentioned, was this 150, this date of the establishment of Jackson Ward um, that led us to understanding we were embarking on this, you know, monumental moment of the 150th anniversary of the neighborhood. And so we found out about it maybe like two and a half months, if that, uh, before the actual date. And so we, but we understood that even though it was a small window, it was imperative that we figured out a way to celebrate the moment. And that, again, it was not accidental. It was indeed ancestral that we were led to that information. And so we were able to galvanize the community from all corners to help us pull off what ended up being a really beautiful celebration of Jackson Ward um, on the 17th of April of this year. Uh, and one aspect of the celebration was these projections that you see in front of you. Uh, we kind of lit up all of Jackson Ward to include its historical footprint, which leads down to Main Street Station, which is where this picture on the left was taken. Uh, and so this is just one example um, of ways in which uh, we hope to elevate the Jackson Ward narrative to implant it deeply into uh, the Richmond narrative and to help people understand that the legacy is so much richer and so much deeper uh, than where we kind of start with it either in the 1950s or with Maggie Walker understanding that they too stand on shoulders. Uh, and these are just some additional photographs from that day. Uh, we have, um, so we have a video, uh, I don't know if we can play it here, but we'll definitely share it uh, so that you can watch it on your own time. Uh, but it is just a beautiful representation of the energy uh, of Jackson Ward and the way people love it. Uh, additionally, uh, through Africana, uh, we screened the premiere of the documentary, How the Monuments Came Down. We partnered with VPM, uh, Jackson Project in Maymont to present this film uh, last month. Uh, we had almost 800 people in attendance. Uh, it was a beautiful evening. We had a beautiful panel discussion as well, or powerful pan panel discussion is what I really should say, to include uh, Cisha, uh, myself as moderator, uh, Joseph Rogers, uh, former councilman Chuck Richardson, uh, Julian Hayter, and Krista uh, Weatherford from- and Princess Blanding. And Princess Blanding, uh, who is the sister of Marcus David Peters. And so um, in, in this space, we had the opportunity to talk about not just the monuments, because the monuments are one thing, but what's the impact of the moment 
that the monuments help to galvanize? Uh, and how do we take full advantage of that moment as we move forward here in Richmond? And so it was, it was a wonderful night for Richmond. And then here uh, is a representation of some of the coverage that uh, the Jackson Project has received. Uh, we are excited to be partnered with Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, they've done an excellent job covering the story of Jackson Ward, the work of the Jackson Project, and figuring out how to, uh, I don't know, get the story out there in a way that Richmond Times Dispatch has not traditionally been associated with doing. Uh, they, are, they understand the moment that they are in as an institution and the importance of them being um, a space that tells a fuller, uh, more complex and more honest uh, narrative around Richmond and its people. And so this is one way that they did that. This is uh, all from one piece that they did, uh, this opening piece where you see uh, Jackson Ward. Um, that was something called a wrap. Cisha and I didn't even know that existed. Uh, it was on front of the front page. Uh, and then, you know, you open it up into this spread that gives different narratives at different points in time uh, here in Richmond. Uh, Michael Paul Williams has been an advocate for this project uh, through RTD uh, from the beginning. Uh, so to see him recently win his Pulitzer Prize uh, just felt amazing, uh, well-deserved. But yeah, um, we have also been featured on PBS, uh, the News Hour. Uh, they came to Richmond as a part of the 150th uh, ce celebration as well. Uh, we are deeply appreciative of their coverage and their excitement and their interest around Jackson Ward. Uh, and then of course, all of the local stations as well. All right, so let's get into what got us here. <laughs> As we said, the, the question that we set out uh, to answer is who is Jackson? And so, you know, when Anjali said, hey, find out this black ass fact, I thought, as most people think in 2020, um, because this was at the end of last year, oh, Google's gonna have the answer. Um, and Google definitely let me down. Uh, it really let me know that there, that this was, um, a topic that's been in contention as early as 1902. Uh, there were five, four to five different Jacksons associated with the Jackson and Jackson Ward. And so we just set out to do the research and try to investigate each one of those Jacksons. And so one of the first ones was President Andrew Jackson. Um, and it was believed that it could have been him because of the naming conventions of some of the other wards. So the city of Richmond established a ward system in 1803. Um, the first wards that were introduced were Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe wards. And then in the mid 1860s, we introduced two additional ones Clay and Marshall. Um, this is actually a map from the 1819 city directory um, that delineates the first three wards. Um, people had assumed that it might have been named after Andrew Jackson because the other uh, wards were named after uh, federal statesmen. However, when, you know, if you've been in Richmond or from Richmond, especially Virginia, not just Virginia, but Richmond in particular, you know that it likes to name its streets, its schools, and its statues after its own sons. And Andrew Jackson was a notable uh, resident of Tennessee. Um, and so beyond that, we weren't able to really find any discernible uh, artifacts that would suggest that it actually actually is named after Andrew Jackson. Um, and also when you understand the time frame in which Jackson Ward was established in 1871, um, it doesn't seem like the most likely picks. So we were able to sit that one down and move on to um, investigate the other Jacksons. So next, we landed on what we were told was James Jackson of the Beer Garden. Um, and so what we found, because to me, this is probably the most fascinating one, is that there was a James Jackson. However, he was a Black resident of Jackson Ward, who was actually one of the first pharmacists in the city of Richmond um, in the early 1900s. He actually had a, a shop that I believe was located at 825 Lee Street, if I'm correct about the address. Um, and so what was interesting, though, is that that is separate and apart from Joseph Jackson. Joseph Jackson was actually a white gentleman, and, and the street that still exists today, Jackson Street, is his namesake. Um, if you look at this uh, 1835 Makaija Bates map um, of the city of Richmond, which is located right here where my mouse is pointing, um, this area of land actually denotes what was called Jackson's Edition. That's how many parcels that he owned at the time. Uh, Richmond used, if you owned a large parcel of land, they used to call your space editions, kind of like Scott's edition of today. 
Um, and so what we were able to delineate is one, Jackson Street is named after a Joseph Jackson, but not necessarily the ward, and that James Jackson and Joseph Jackson were not one and the same people. Um, the next thing is that Joseph Jackson was white versus James Jackson was black. Um, his daughter, actually, Alice Jackson, is the young lady who was denied entry to UVA on the basis of race. And her denial um, to UVA actually resulted in the Doval Act which of 1936, which sent black students out of the state of Virginia for education for almost 20 years and laid the legal framework for what would become Brown versus the Board of Education. So we know that he is a black man versus Joseph Jackson was a white gentleman. Um, he was actually one of the first clerks in the city's auditor's office. And so that was a that was an interesting tidbit. But what we think might have happened over the years and why people might have assumed that Joseph was black was because uh, if you know this photo, this is the 1905 uh, Emancipation Day Parade on Broad Street. Now, although that the Emancipation Day Parades would eventually make their way to Broad Street, they would actually begin in Jackson Ward in front of his business and his home. And so we think that over the years, maybe because of the fact that Emancipation Day Parade would start in front of his residence, that it might've just become folklore that he was black. He was actually a white man. So that's the second big find. The third big find is the fact that it was not a beer garden. Um, so beer gardens were really distinct to German immigrants. They did not really start to uh, see uh, a pickup and an uptick in the United States until the mid 1850s. Um, however, what Joseph Jackson operated was called a pleasure garden. Um, I think what you can just say is that the biggest difference is, is that one, he operated it in the early 1800s. Second, that it wasn't um, a German tradition. Pleasure gardens were more so like gardens. They were inter entertainment spaces, they might have had spirits, but alcohol wasn't necessarily the main draw. You could have music, you could have food, it was a festive environment. Versus beer gardens are really distinct to German immigrants and the beer is really the center of the space. What we think also might have happened over the years is the fact that the early settlers and what will become Jackson Ward, in addition to becoming freed and enslaved Black people, you also had a significant amount of immigrants who were relegated to that neighborhood too, to include German immigrants. So we think over the years, although Joseph Jackson and James Jackson and a garden of some sort existed, it's been um, deemed a conflated history over the years. And just two more things. So this is the article that talks about the fact that the uh, Emancipation Day parades began in front of Joseph Jackson's uh, establishment. And this is actually a picture of James Jackson's pharmacy. So just trying to incorporate some of the primary artifacts into the presentation for you. All right, so then let's go on to the next Jackson, Giles B. Jackson. So it's very interesting when Anjali was first, um, when I first asked her who is Jackson, she said that she was told that it was Giles B. Jackson. And so I, um, you know, admittedly did not know who Giles B. Jackson was. Giles B. Jackson uh, was the only, one of the only of the four or five, I guess you could say four or five, because really people thought that James and Joseph were the same person. But he was the only one that was Black out of the uh, four potential Jacksons that were in the running. This is a Black man who was born enslaved in the counties. Um, he was actually a body servant to the Confederacy during the Civil War. At that time, he could not read or write. And he goes on to live I mean, when we think about the term black excellence, he, he all that he was able to accomplish considering his particular origin story is almost unbelievable. He would go on to become the first black person to be licensed to practice law in the state of Virginia. He was the first black person to be commissioned by a federal entity to curate a black history museum during the Jamestown Tercentennial. Um, he was invited to inaugural uh, parades and uh, um, bestowed with honor, with honor as a colonel um, he was fa fantastic. I mean, it was just, he defied all odds. And when we think about the Black excellence and the reputation of Jackson Ward, he really embodies that spirit. Um, however, unfortunately, when you, when you look at the timelines, the chronological timelines and the details, um, you're able to sit that one down um, also. So let's get to who we, you know, the most compelling evidence to suggest who uh, the Jackson and Jackson Ward is. So as Anjali said, we were able to recover the date in which Jackson Ward was established. That was in 1871. 
Um, once we recognize not only that it was established in 1871, which is during the height of reconstruction, what we also were able to recover is the fact that it was a gerrymandered political district. So if you look at this newspaper article, as you'll see, it says Jackson Ward as it was and Jackson Ward as it is, as it is now. They went from four different wards across, across Clay, Monroe, Madison, and Jefferson before April 17th, 1871. And then they relegated all of the Black and concentrated all of the Black vote into one large ward. And so once we understood, okay, it's reconstruction, you're trying to suppress Black vote through gerrymandering, we recognize that we have to kind of like go back in history and understand what's happening before 1871, that Black Richmonders would be such a threat that they would feel like they needed to, to create a gerrymandered political district. And so that helped us understand more about this dynamic of urbanized enslavement, um, understanding that as part of the industrial wave, what we have is that Black Richmonders are actually migrating from working on plantations in the counties, and they're starting to come into the city to work at plants. Um, this industrial wave is the primary reason why Richmond became the relocated um, capital of the Confederacy, because we had the infrastructure necessary to, uh, com to, to create um, um, to, we had the, the infrastructure to have an industry to be able to produce weaponry. Um, and so once we understood that a little bit more, we understood because of this dynamic where enslaved people aren't even necessarily living with their enslavers, instead they're living in what will become Jackson Ward and boarded, boarded homes that were out for rent. Um, what you have is this, like Anjali uh, says often, you know, this emergence of the side hustle. You have dynamics where people can, one, make a profit off of their labor in the plants and or since they're not living with their enslaver, once they uh, get off of work at the plants, they actually take up second jobs. And so what you see is the birth of these Black entrepreneurs and these Black professionals, or we have Black eating houses, we have Black grog shops, we have uh, laundresses, blacksmiths, barbers, all really starting to spring up in, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, plasterers, you name it. Um, it's a whole cohort of Black professionals. And they're able to use those, uh, those funds to either buy their own freedom and or by the freedom of their family members. And so once we understood that there was a certain level of financial fortitude that was already happening in what would become Jackson Ward in the early into mid 18th 1800s, what we recognize is then when those federal amendments come down, and that's uh, supplemented by the by a certain level of political prowess. We recognize that Black Richmonders were a significant threat, and so that really helped um, us get to the last Jackson, especially when we landed in 1870. So a couple of things happened in 1870 that are really really important. So what we have is one: we have that Robert E. Lee dies. So we recognize about Robert E. Lee's death is that he dies on October 17th, 1870. And in that following week, a couple of things happen. One, there is a, uh, a nationwide, for the Confederacy that is, a nationwide call to uh, you know, go into six months worth of mourning. And that's actually out of VMI. And what we find is that that next week as well, immediately following his death, the Common Council establishes a subcommittee to redistrict Five, the five political boundaries into six. Now, mind you, the sixth ward has no name at the time. You fast forward exactly six months to the day on April 17th, 1871. That's when we have the establishment of Jackson Ward. Now, why that's also important in 1870 is because what we have is the Underwood Constitution. And the Underwood Constitution, even though it, uh, drafting began in 1867, it goes into enactment in 1870. And one of the critical things that that requires is that each um, county across the state divide itself into no less than six parts or no less than three parts. And so what we have is to the north of Richmond, we have a place called Richmond County, which still exists today. What they do is they divide themselves into three townships. And one of their townships that they do in 1871 is the township of Stonewall. And then we come back to Richmond, as we said, on April 17th, 1871, they established what would then become Jackson Ward. And what we know is that they established 
establish Jackson Ward as a political gerrymander district, particularly to sway the, the political or to reshift political power back to ex-Confederate conservatives. But what's also uh, very telling about this decision is that the day following the establishment of Jackson Ward to the south of the city of Richmond, what we have is Manchester, which at the at this point was not annexed yet into the city of Richmond. And they, they petitioned to establish two additional wards that they want to respectively call Lee and Jackson Ward. So now we have precedent that in 1871, on the heels of the Underwood Constitution, we have petitions and or the establishment of gerrymandered political districts to the north and the south and within the city of Richmond that all either take on the name Stonewall and or Jackson. Now, what's interesting, I'll go to this one and then go back. So this is actually a map of the different town, um, townships within Stonewall or within Richmond County. And even though they've changed their names to now districts, as you see, they still actually to this day maintain um, what is still called the Stonewall District. Um, and also what we also want to show you really quickly is a couple of things. When we, talk, when we talk about that urbanized enslavement system and how there was a certain level of freedom among Black Richmonders well before the Emancipation Proclamation, this is actually the city director of 1852. And as you'll see, it says free colored um, housekeepers, but really this was the, the listing of any free Black Richmonder in the city at the time. And it's oh, almost 400 people listed um, in 1852 and what will become the capital of the Confederacy. So when we talk about those multidimensional narratives, that's not one that you commonly hear, that there are over almost 400 free Black Richmonders maintaining households and our professionals, because in addition to telling you their name and where they live, it also gives you their profession. Um, what's also interesting about this, and I don't know if I can zoom in in the current mode that I'm in, but this is a map from 1856. And what you will see, if you look at, pay attention to these red dots, I know they're pretty micro right now on the screen, but these red dots denote what's within the city of directory, which are all of the freed black homeowners and Richmonders in the city. Now, what you have here is the map after the gerrymandering of Jackson Ward. And if you were to overlay this map, with this one, what you will find, which is the FW Beers map, what you will find is that they really took those, follow my, my, my mouse, they took those red dots and literally used it to delineate the political boundaries of what will become Jackson Ward. And so it wasn't, you know, it was quite blatant um, how they went about um, suppressing Black vote at this time. But what's also very interesting, and I can send this map to you all um, after the presentation is over so that you can see it a little bit more up close and personal, is what was the historical footprint of Jackson Ward? It actually extended all the way from the city boundaries and what is now known as Henrico all the way down to 18th Street. And so even when we think about just when people ask, well, what is historic Jackson Ward? I generally try to say, well, are we talking about the historic district as we know it today? Or are we talking about the historical confines of Jackson Ward, which actually extended to the train station and to the original African burial grounds? So that's also a very important, I can't say fine, because some who are historians already knew this, but an elevation of an of a undertold um, truth. So really quickly, let's try to connect this to the Constitution project. So what we found uh, uh, through the research is a couple of things. We understand more about the founding of Jackson Ward. We know that this was a plot of land that was originally owned by William Byrd, but then he had a lottery. And as a result of that lottery, he sold off par parcels of the land um, to a small set of families, the Coots family, the Jacksons, meaning Joseph Jackson, uh, the Duvalls. And so they all all operated within this space in this what what would become eventually Jackson Ward as early as the uh, mid 1700s okay um, what's interesting about Jackson Ward is because the city was annexed in so many different iterations parts of Jackson Ward would become part of the city of Richmond incrementally over the years um, one of the biggest finds that we found through the research is uh, more about this gentleman named Abraham Peyton Skipwith. He is the first Black homeowner to own property within the city of uh, 
of the city of Richmond's Jackson Ward. He actually purchased parcels of land in 1793. Um, but what's also interesting about him is that he is one of the first, if not the first, Black Richmonders to have a fully executed will. Um, and this is actually his cottage. And, and this is a copy of his will um, that, that helps to delineate his, his home and his, um, I guess you could say his intentions for what he wanted, not only for the home by way of home ownership, but like how he wanted to leverage the home as an entrepreneurial hub because he gave very specific instructions on what he wanted his uh, granddaughter to do with the home to make more money and to keep it in the family. Um, and so it's a really uh, fascinating will if you ever have time to check it out. And what you'll see right here, these are the minutes that actually established Jackson Ward in April 17th, 1871. So that's the founding of this space. And this really just talks about the impact of the gerrymandering, which we've already kind of talked about at a high level. This is the annexation map, which will show you how Jackson Ward, particularly along uh, Duval Street and Jackson Street, which is directly connected to Abraham Peyton Skipwith as his home was located at 400 Duval Street, um, slowly but surely were absorbed within the city of Richmond. Um, this also just kind of gives you a little bit more context around what the city of Richmond was, was like in 1870. You know, we talk about that Underwood Constitution and we talk about the fact that radical Republicans were vying, um, were, were trying to maintain their stronghold against ex-Confederate conservatives. But I mean, Richmond was really a mess. I mean, that particular year, they have what is called the Richmond mayoralty case. And some people call it the municipal war. And what it was, was this had actually had to go to the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals to decide who would become uh, the person in control of the city of Richmond. Um, and during that, we have police brutality, we have election fraud with ballot boxes actually being stolen from Jackson Ward, we have two dueling uh, city governments, we have two dueling police departments, actually with the colonel of the um, Republican police department actually being led by a black man named Benjamin Scott. And so when we talk about the city of Richmond is on fire in 1871, we really mean it. It is really a space that is contentious and highly at war um, with one another uh, for political power. And what we have is that the Court of Appeals actually side with ex-Confederates and we see a swift shift in political power in 1870 that results in what would become a gerrymandered political district with Jackson Ward in 1871. And now what we have, you know, we're, we still see the remnants of what then would become a red line space. You know, we went from being gerrymandered to red line. Uh, you know, we have this gentleman named Harlan Bartholomew. He is an urban planner who was actually hired to go all across this, the country in, in the 1930s and 1940s to do urban renewal planning. Um, and that's really code for Negro removal. He goes into these spaces and he uh, creates, he uses infrastructure projects to pretty much gut black communities. And so what you hear, is, what you see here is what was originally over 700 homes and what would be a uh, historical Jackson Ward. This is actually Six Mount Zion, um, which was one of the only spaces to still remain as a result of this infrastructure project. Um, and just so that you know, it's now part of Interstate 95, but at the time it was known as Richmond Petersburg Turnpike. And it essentially devastated this community in a way that it's still trying to recover from today. Um, and that's when we see spaces like Gilpin Court start to um, rise up with public housing facilities and really uh, the breakdown of what were originally a space of black entrepreneurship and not just a space for, but arguably, arguably the birthplace. Um, and we start to see black banks, black businesses, Black home ownership really starts to experience a sharp decline. And then that brings us here, you know, a space that is now actively regentrified, uh, getting gen that is actively gentrified, um, particularly within the confines of the historic district. Um, it's very interesting that now the median income home price in Jackson Ward is $350,000. Um, and what we're seeing is the continued impact of that disruption of the interstate um, on intergenerational wealth among Black Richmonders. Um, and so let's talk about that connection and why that was mentioned. So your project, if it's our understanding, you guys are exploring the enduring impact of the Constitution on the lives of Virginians. And you guys are really leveraging archival 
uh, information at the library in order to do your project. And that you guys are really tasked with developing or at least uh, demonstrating and, and, and um, exhibiting how your research and critical thinking skills can help to drive collaborate collaboration among internal external stakeholders to tell these full narratives as it relates to the Constitution. And that really is the crux of what we do with Jackson. Um, it's community, it's collaboration, it's understanding that research and access to archival information can help to tell fuller, more complete truths. And so when we think about that 1870 Constitution and how not only it laid the framework for the establishment of Jackson Ward as a space that then would become gerrymandered and then redlined and now uh, gentrified. What we also understand is that several Black Jackson Wardians had a key stake in that process and were actually able to, I guess you could say, find their way as a result of this constitution because they actually use the 1870 constitution to, to you know, show some level of political prowess, even with the descendants of Abraham Skip with organizing what would be the color convention of 1869. And it was this political prowess that they were demonstrated, which made Black Richmonders seem like such a threat because not only did they were they endowed and invested with the rights to vote, but they were really out here actively organizing and were very successful and effective at it. Um, we might not have time to go into all of this, but what we know is that the work of those Black Jackson Wardians around the 1870 timeframe laid the foundation for what would become the Readjuster Party, um, which would emerge Im immediately following the Reconstruction era. And what we know is that during this period, um, that helps to fully shift political control completely back to Confederate conservatives. Um, and that is what would usher in the Jim Crow era, which would lay the, the foundation for the 1901-1902 Constitution of Virginia, which then helped to legalize racial segregation and then disenfranchise Black voters. And we knew that that, what you all I'm pretty sure know through your project, is that that Constitution would stay intact until 1971 with the Constitution that you guys are analyzing and how it then went on to reflect the most recent legal protections of the civil rights area uh, era. And so what's interesting when we you know, think about Jackson, the Jackson project and how it connects to your constitution project, I guess if we could leave you with anything to help guide the conversation is when you examine the state's constitutions as like a continuum of sorts, what has changed and versus what has remained the same on leveraging public policy to help realize a more diverse, equitable, inclusive, just and accessible life for all Virginians.